Gap with Dr. Richard Lane, and we are talking about his book, Neuroscience and Enduring Change, Implications for Psychotherapy. Um, now, in the previous segment, we were talking about memory, um, specifically how um, when you have a psychotherapy session, you actually could have like a wonderful kind of opening and changing of a memory and how you have a four to six hour window of possibly um, either layering or cementing in some of those great memories. And um, we closed by you saying like, well, I wonder, you know, in terms of what is the best recommendations for duration spacing and number of psychotherapy sessions based on what you learned about how the brain works. So I wanted to talk about, um, follow up on that. And just generally figure out like, how do you even know if something's working? Because, you know, the, the hard thing about therapy is you go in, you're not sure if it's worked. And we can cover that later, but let's go into the following from our last segment. Um, recommendations on the duration spacing and number of psychotherapy sessions based on your data. Well, I think the, um, if you take the, the model seriously with regard to having corrective experiences and then having a night of sleep, for example, or a nap. Um, it opens up the, the question about, you know, how long sessions should be. This is all kind of new territory. So um, it could be that what you're looking for is, you know, discussing a problematic topic, reactivating the old memory, having a corrective experience, um, and then, you know, potentially stopping the session. I, I'm, this is really kind of research for the future. The idea is how can we, you know, re-engineer psychotherapy to be as optimal as possible. Mm. Okay. Now, so, you know, you mentioned retreats. I mean, I think it really raises those kinds of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, although there are intensive programs and even some retreat options available, you know, that's not typically how therapy is done. Right. And so and just and to just to bring people up to speed. So in the last session, we were talking about you have a grant opening during your session with the therapist. You take a nap and maybe have another session right afterwards mm -hmm. um, or you come back the next day, which is generally not how sessions proceed. They're usually done right. every week or every two weeks or whatever. Mm -hmm. So sorry, go ahead. Yeah. OK, so. Um... It's a really important question. How can you tell if you're making good progress or not? Um, I think, first of all, um, you have to ask yourself, do you feel comfortable and safe with your therapist? Do you feel like you're working on things and talking about things that are important to you? Um, do you see evidence of change, not necessarily big changes, but maybe some small changes where there's a kind of a snowball effect where one thing can lead to another. We talked about how overcoming avoidance and, you know, trying out new things and seeing how that goes, you know, are you doing some of that, right? And I think when therapy is going well, um, it has a momentum to it. Mm -hmm. So you really feel like, you know, there's progress being made and you can see how one thing leads to another and to another. And um, I think that progress, when you start to see areas of improvement, but let's say, um, you know, it's two steps forward and one step back, that's really how it works. So just because there's you know, disappointments or, you know, the new skill that you're trying to develop doesn't work very well, you know, don't be completely discouraged because it's, it's a, you know, we, we think it's really true that it took a long time to develop, you know, these bad habits or bad schemas, if you will. And it, it can take quite a while to modify them. I think what we're really trying to do in psychotherapy 
is, you know, create, get the person on a new path and create a new trajectory so that the therapy can continue on its own, essentially. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then how, how do you create enduring change? So we had talked about, you know, let's say that in psychotherapy, sometimes they're like, I feel like I'm talking a lot. I sort of feel like I'm changing, but like, I don't see, I'm trying some new things, but I don't really feel like I'm making huge amount of progress. But as you said, like sometimes what a psychotherapist sees as progress, you may be like, well, yeah, okay. Talk to someone, you know, I did this in a different way and you're not necessarily marking what progress may look like from a site, from a psychotherapist standpoint. So what does progress or snowballing even look like? Yeah. Is it, how big well, is the change okay. to be, be like a change? Like if all of a sudden I had a new idea, is that a change or does a change have to re right. relate to a behavior? Or, or an emotion. Right. Uh, right. So I think a, a new idea, you know, can be, can contribute to a change, right? But I think what we're talking about is kind of overall patterns of adaptation, you know, most commonly in social relationships. And mm -hmm. if you're going to therapy for that, are you seeing a real change in, in terms of how things are going there? Um, so let me, let me say, I think, so we talk about three fundamental steps involved in bringing about enduring change. Mm -hmm. And the first one is to activate the old problematic memory and the associated painful emotion, right? Mm -hmm. And because we think that so often these maladaptive patterns arise because of painful emotion that we're trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. So one kind of indicator of whether or not you're really getting to the problem is, are you really activating that problematic emotion? And are you really experiencing it in the session? Okay, so let's, let's use the example that we gave in the previous session. Let's say that you have a fear of doing public presentations. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, as a result, you find that the root cause of that problem was when you were 10 years old and the teacher screamed at you or like dismissed you when you were doing a presentation. So would it be activating, like reactivating your, your teacher's living experience, the emotional, visual, whatever kind of aesthetic of yes. the teacher and seeing if you're kind of like, oh, I'm fine. It, would that be what you're talking about or something? Well, different? it would be like, really reactivating it so that you really kind of experience it in the moment and you really feel how awful it was at that time. That's okay. okay. Um, and then to, you know, bring in, you know, to have a corrective experience where like you, you expect, you know, the therapist or other people to respond in a negative judgmental critical way. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And and when they, if they really knew what happened, they'd really come down hard on you, right? right? But then, so they really hear what really happened and lo and behold, they're very compassionate and loving mm. and caring and non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. And um, that induces an emotional experience, which is corrective because it's mm. counter to expectation, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. But let me add just another nuance to this. Because yeah, let's say you had that terrible experience with your teacher, but you know people differ in terms of their temperament, and so some people are more easily emotionally aroused than others, mm -hmm. right? More prone to having negative emotions than others. Okay, so maybe that kid who had that experience, not only had a horrible experience with that teacher, but also in talking with the therapist, you kind of learn, well, your basic temperament is somebody who's pretty highly emotionally aroused, which is why you had such a strong reaction to that. So now you can learn an additional thing about yourself that, uh, and ways to deal with that. It's helpful to know that about yourself and maybe to normalize it in a way. Mm -hmm. How can you, you know, use that information to facilitate your adaptation mm. in various situations. So it adds another layer to it, okay? okay. So 
there are three steps. Activate the old memory and, and the old painful emotion, which is hard. Right. Number two, have a you know good relationship with your psychotherapist and have that corrective experience. Mm -hmm. And then the third step is to carry it over into other contexts and practice new ways of construing situations and responding to situations differently. Okay, so in other words, okay. you know, going back and having more interviews and, you know, building upon the positive experience. Like, for example, in talking with you, you know, it really matters that you respond so enthusiastically and say, oh, this is fascinating. It's like, wow, that really feels good to me. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I want to do that some more. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, it, it's that kind of thing where you have to keep practicing. And then, yeah, I've- okay, uh, so, that's, so the third step is having, converting these episodic experiences into uh, enduring somatic structures by practicing new ways of behaving. Yes, so that gets into the different kinds of memories, okay? Mm -hmm. um, remember we said that the, that the problems that people have that are bring about these recurrent difficulties are schematic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the schematic are a distillation of multiple episodic. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And so you can have a very potent episodic memory from the experience in therapy mm -hmm. that contributes to and updates that schematic memory. Right. But then you want to have more and more episodic experiences really to consolidate that change in the schema. Uh, okay, got it. So we go back to this, the scenario we set up um, hypothetically is, you know, you have a bunch of radio interviews, you have five that are like neutral, five, one that's great, and then ends up being five or six that are really great. But this all has to do with like when I'm making all this has nothing to do with you, but I'm just making up sure. stuff. Okay, it has to do with when you're 10 years old and like a, the right. know, yelled at you. <laughs> so like you meet with a psychotherapist and you're like, I hate doing these interviews. Why? Then you find out it's because you did a presentation where you're expressing, you know, your work um, in school and a teacher said something awful to you. And so that is why you kind of dread having these interviews. So you would go back, meet with the therapist. So here's my, here's what I understand so far, go back, meet with the therapist. They kind of like have a loving, um, corrective emotional experience so that you're altering your kind of original episodic, um, um episodic experience, which is teacher yelling at you, right? You, you, your therapist says, you know, that wasn't the right thing. And you just kind of completely change. You're really held like you were expressing yourself and that was okay. You know, whatever therapist says, right? you're like, wow, that was really great. Ideally take a nap or don't go be layering a whole bunch of stuff during that day to like mm -hmm. clog up this great, beautiful gold nugget because you take yeah. the gold nugget, poor working out on a treadmill, arguing with your spouse onto right. it. It's like you're muddying the waters. Okay, so when you have these great sessions with your counselor or therapist, like allow the reconsolidation to be done in a clean way. Um, then, you have these new experiences. So like hypothetically, you have a new interview with someone and you've done this work, you know, and you try out this new interview, your sixth interview, and it's like, can be completely different. And because you've changed kind of your relationship, it sounds like to this first memory. And then the, you know, the first mem episodic memory that caused this whole construct. And then basically these, five episodic experiences that were like neutral, they created a schematic, your schematic can be updated. Is that, am I getting it right? You are. Okay, yeah, you so are now, good. now what do I do with the, how do I make this enduring now? So tell me how I can convert these, update these episodic. So let's say it's you, you've had these like, you know, horrible experience when you're 10, five neutral interviews, one great interview. What do you do now going forward? You, you're no longer avoiding. You're now going out and exposing yourself, mm -hmm. and um, you're you because 
the, the idea would be that because you're not apprehensive about it, but you're actually starting to develop some confidence, you now have an interview and it feels good. And it's just snowballing so that you have one good experience after uh. another. And then when you have a bad experience, it's not so devastating. Ah, you know, uh, okay. So that's how you know psychotherapy is working because you that's have this right. kind of snowball. You like your your reaction to the first. You're changing your behavior. You're like, oh, maybe actually this interview wasn't so bad. Then you actually mm -hmm. have like this interview was good. Mm -hmm. And then you have like this interview is good. This interview was bad, and I'm not reverting mm -hmm. back to my catastrophic schematic that I had before. That's that's exactly right. Okay, okay. so that's how you know it's like it's so, working. So you don't know how relevant this is to the, the total humiliation I had in third grade at the piano recital when I freaked out. <laughs> it's all, I've, I've worked with enough people to know it's all related as something. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so the essential ingredients are, you know, a strong alliance, um, empathy from a counselor, um, making sure you have times to um, work with these kind of episodic events, some of them which are grand, um, sleeping. Um, what are other some, what other kind of um, recommendations do you have to just like make the most, because psychotherapy is so expensive and some people now, a lot of people have to pay out of pocket. So how can you make the most of your sessions? Mm. Well, there's another implication um, that we talk about that is somewhat unexpected that comes from this new um, new perspective. Um, and that is the following. I'm a psychiatrist and you know we treat people, a lot of people with anxiety and depression, for example. And there's no question that the data shows that the um, med the combination of medication and psychotherapy works better than either alone. Okay, mm -hmm. and it's it's quite um, quite common uh, for people with anxiety or depression to have difficulty sleeping, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things we do clinically is we just want to make sure that people get back to a normal sleep pattern, mm -hmm. okay? And that does contribute to, it's not en enough, but it contributes to the alleviation of symptoms. And sometimes the sleep problem is part of a syndrome and the syndrome gets treated and you know, the sleep improves. Um, it turns out though that um, we don't really think about how the medications that we're giving influence memory reconsolidation. So, oh. example, so they might, some of these medications interfere with REM sleep, for example, oh. when uh, emotional memories get reconsolidated. Okay? Wow. So, you know, that's a whole new area to really be attentive to in the future. And because, you know, I think one model of how the two work together is that you know you get a reduction in symptoms with the combination, uh, but then you want to maybe continue with psychotherapy to eliminate the background, you know, maladaptive pattern that's leading you, you know, that contributes to your risk for relapse, right? And mm -hmm. so we want to bring about mm -hmm. enduring change, and you're still on the medication. And uh, there's a caution here. Let's make sure that the medication you're on isn't interfering with your REM sleep, for example, so that the memory reconsolidation can proceed well without interference. Okay, that was huge. I literally, when you said that, I got chills all over my body and I don't even take any of these medications, but I think that that's huge because here are people who are trying to get better in terms of their mental health, right? They're taking various depression meds, anxiety meds, but, and doing psychological work. And it could be, they're not getting good sleep, undoing all their good psycho psychological that's, work. That's exactly right. Change. <gasps> that's a, I mean, oh my that's God. exactly right. I mean, just, just what you mentioned. I mean, 
it's very important that you sleep well, you know? Oh my God. Okay, okay so and there's certain sleep meds. Well and don't interfere with your, well. Which meds, can you say them on the air or you like, you don't have enough research to know? I don't want to blind any medications okay. right now, but okay. I think it's just something to be aware of. I know that's huge. So you could be undoing because it, it, the general idea is like they work hand in hand, but in mm -hmm. fact, they could be one could be undoing the benefits okay. of actually having enduring. Change. It could be, and I want to emphasize wow. that, that this, that on the one hand, this is the value of a new theory and model that we've developed. Yeah. It raises this question. But the research hasn't been done yet to really mm. see if it's true and to really see what medications mm. work and don't work in this context. Okay. Right. Wow. Okay. And so is this what you're talking about? Your physiological self? Is that what is that is that something different or similar? In your book, you talked about your physiolog physiological self. Mm. Well, yeah, we we talk about the sense of self. Um, and I think it's a little bit different from what it we're is. talking okay. about now. Okay, yeah. I didn't want to confuse things. Okay, mm -hmm. this is fantastic in terms of like things that you can do. Um, but let's say you don't sleep well and you don't take any meds, but you're like, I know that sleep is going to be important. Can you take something like, I take a Benadryl when I'm like, okay, I can't get to sleep. I'll just take a Benadryl. Is there a danger in doing that? If it helps Good you question. sleep more soundly? <laughs> um, well, it's important to get to sleep. Uh, Benadryl, you know, has uh, anticholinergic properties which influence uh, certain phases of sleep and SSRIs influence other phases of sleep. And so it's like, uh, in some ways you have to choose your poison. But the really important thing to know is that there's something called CBTI, which is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which involves no medication at all, right? Oh, and then do and that. It involves yeah. sleep hygiene and following all sorts of rules about, like, for example, only only use your bed for sleeping. You yes, know, or, yes. That would so be the route to go. Yeah, because it sounds like right, all but the don't research hang out in your bed. Like, right. Yeah, okay. got it. And all. Right, that's a real important implication of this. Okay, really huge. Um, we've been talking to Dr. Lane, who is the author of Neuroscience of Enduring Change, Implications for Psychotherapy. And we've been talking about personally for people who are going through psychotherapy, how some of his new research um, can impact um, your enduring change that you would have in your work. Thank you so much.